Great job, everyone. How do I preach after that? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> of course, it's part of our series of Jesus Radio Superstar, and that song uh, from now on from the movie The Greatest Showman. And uh, warning, spoiler alert, I'm going to be talking about the movie. It came out in 2017, so it's been out for a few years. So if you haven't seen it yet, well, well the movie isn't exactly plot-driven. Let's put it that way. But this movie, The Greatest Showman, is a glossy portrait of the American show business pioneer P.T. Barnum, with Hugh Jackman starring as the main character. While it was fun watching Wolverine sing and dance, what struck me most about the movie was its overall theme, (laughs) which seemed to be a celebration of uniqueness, a celebration of human diversity and, and a challenge to the culture of conformity that we live in. And in the movie, Barnum doesn't start off recognizing the beauty of diversity, just the opposite. He's trying to fit in. He sees his dad struggling as a tailor and being mistreated by the Hallett family for whom he worked. So the young Barnum, after his dad dies, decides he's not going to live the same life that his dad did. He wanted more. So he chases after a life that he thinks will bring him the value that his dad never had and his youth never gave him. But along the way, he falls in love with the Hallett daughter, Charity. Good name. But of course, the father disapproves of his daughter being in a relationship with such a boy of such lower class. And she's sent off to finishing school. But the two exchange letters through the years, and they eventually marry. But Charity's father, upon his daughter leaving to be with her new husband, P.T. Barnum, who has made a little bit of money working on the railroads, but still can't provide the luxury life that of, of her upbringing. Charity's father tells Barnum that she'll be back after he fails to provide the life that she's used to. Barnum and his new wife, Charity, settle into their little apartment, and they have two daughters, and he takes a job as a clerk at a shipping company, and everyone seems happy. But then the shipping company goes bankrupt, he loses his job, and he realizes he doesn't have the life that he promised his wife that she would have, one more glamorous and wealthy. But Charity, the wife, keeps on telling him, no, I'm happy just the way things are with this little family, but he's not. He remembers his dad struggling and his father-in-law telling him that he'll lose his family once he fails. So he determines to become a financial and business success just to prove everyone wrong, including himself. So he defrauds the bank into giving him a loan to open up a wax museum. And it becomes kind of a modest success But one night sitting with his daughters, they tell him that he should display something alive. And I think there was more wisdom in that suggestion than his first apparent. So Barnum gathers what, you know, freaks to display. People outside of the mainstream. People who hide themselves because they get bullied for being different. There was the little person, the bearded lady, the tall guy, the fat man, people who can't hide the fact that they're different from others. But I love the way he recruits these freaks for his circus. He shows them the beauty and the strength of being different. They weren't freaks. They were unique. They had something that no one else had. And as he gathered these unique people together, and as the circus gained success, this gathering of unique people who once were called freaks began to see themselves as a family. They accepted each other when they were rejected by the world. And in Barnum's circus, they were being admired and celebrated in ways that brought them life, that brought out their unique gifts, that showed everyone who could see the beauty of difference. Barnum was indeed following his daughter's advice 
He was showing people something alive. Flipping ahead through the movie, Barnum achieves everything he dreamed about and worked hard to accomplish. But then his once loving wife becomes distant. He's away from his family for months at a time. He's creating his dream life, but without those who mean the most to him. And his life crumbles when the circus catches fire, burning it to embers. And then his wife, Charity, leaves him and returns home, just as his father-in-law predicted. So losing everything, he finds himself in a bar, numbing the pain of this overwhelming loss with copious amounts of beer. And that's when the ensemble, the troupe, appears, these freaks, these unique people, and they confront him for giving up so easily. They remind him that he created this family, and they challenge him to start over. And this is where the song picks up the plot. Barnum realizes that his ambitions and his achievements were the result of living up to someone else's expectations, not his own. He created a life that many people would envy, but it left him broke, empty, and alone. And he, become, he, he has this awareness, and so he sings this. I drank champagne with kings and queens. The politicians praised my name. But those are someone else's dreams, the pitfalls of the man I became. In one way, this is a song of regret, but another way, it's a song of celebration. It's a song of personal empowerment, of realizing himself. Because I love the realization that he re saw that he was chasing someone else's dreams, because not everyone recognizes that when they are doing that that he was living according to someone else's agenda. Because isn't that what many of us do? Because many times someone else's dreams for us don't celebrate the unique, unique gifts and skills that we have. We get put in a box, usually a box of someone else's fears and doubts that is placed onto us. Or even their society's pressures. That's what Barnum fell into. It was a trap of celebrity culture, where you aren't someone unless you are famous, unless everyone knows who you are, where popularity equals value, where notoriety means influence. It's the cult of power, prestige, and possessions that I've talked about here many, many times. A cult that's very still alive in our Western world, and it's a cult that many of us don't even realize we are part of. He goes on. For years and years, I chased their cheers, the crazy speed of always needing more. But when I stop and see you there, I remember who all this was for. Barnum realizes that he's not being his most real, authentic self. He keeps chasing after more and more, but the more he gets, the less of himself he feels. So he makes a decision right there, right now. He's giving up ch after chasing affirmation and celebrity and will start living his most authentic life. And he finally understands what's most important to him and he starts chasing after that. And from now on, these eyes will not be blinded by the lights. From now on, what's waited till tomorrow starts tonight. It starts tonight. And let this promise in me start like an anthem in my heart from now on. So he leaves the business, turning over operations to his partner, Philip Carlyle, who bankrolled the rebuilding of the circus through his share of the profits. And Barnum returns to his wife and daughters and promises to spend more time with them. And the circus opens again under a tent and becomes a big success in its new venue and without Barnum's guiding hand. He learned that the humble life can be just as rich or even richer than one of power, prestige, and possessions. And now because he was living his most authentic life. 
And then he finally heard his wife when she was saying, and she wasn't lying when she said it, that she didn't need him to be a great success for them to be happy. She just needed a loving husband, a caring father. And he finally came, as the song says, back home. To me, this movie asks the questions, what do we celebrate? What kind of life does our culture define as the good life? Do we have a society that honors and celebrates difference and diversity of people's gifts and skills and talents? Or do we put people in a box that is not of their own making? Do we have a culture and society that helps people grow into who God made them to be? Or are we making people serve another master? Scripture says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around, looking for someone to devour. I think the adversary that prowls around is the voice that tells us, you aren't good enough just as you are. You have to prove your worth. You have to show others that you deserve being here on this planet. And that adversary that prowls, it, it devours dreams, it destroys authentic living, and it keeps us from being our deepest selves. But it keeps telling us that we have to chase after the dreams that other people have for us. It tells us that our gifts, our skills, our talents can be put aside to serve some other agenda that someone else has for us. Because I think our society and culture talks a good game about encouraging people to live their most authentic selves. But then there's pressure to actually conform, to take the regular route, to live the life that everyone else is living, placing people in boxes, that actually serves the machinery of our society and culture to keep it humming along without disruption. And the church, I have to say, is historically being complicit in the culture of conformity. Churches have been palaces of conformity. The church was where everyone believed the same doctrines, prayed the same prayers, dressed the same way, looked the same. Differences were exposed and condemned as heresy. And obedience was celebrated. But Jesus didn't demand conformity. Because time after time, encounter after encounter, Jesus lifted up and celebrated people who were different. The Samaritan woman at the well who had no business talking to someone who was Jewish, much less talking to a Jewish man. Or it was the lepers who were shunned and cut off from society. They were welcomed and they were healed. The tax collector who got rich by betraying his people. He was received by Jesus, brought into fellowship with a zealot. A zealot whose life work was to destroy people like the tax collector. Jesus was bringing all these people in. And that's because he knew that each person, each human being, each creature created by a loving God is unique. They have specific gifts, skills, and talents, dreams, and ambitions that can be honored and celebrated. And he also knew that the world that we human beings create we often value sameness rather than diversity. We prefer the safety of conformity rather than the insecurity of freedom. We try to control others out of our fears rather than allow people to strengthen their gifts and use them in ways that give life to the world and to themselves. And I'm going to get the rest of my sermon sitting over there. This is my unique gift of forgetting things. Because at the end, we see that Barnum humbled himself, choosing a seemingly smaller life than the one he was previously living. But it was a richer life. It was more authentic. 
He stopped chasing someone else's dreams and started living the dream that God had placed in him. And that's the hope that I have for Finn as Finn is received into this family of faith through the sacrament of holy baptism. It is my prayer that she will grow into her most authentic self, chasing the dreams that God has placed in her, chasing her gifts and skills and talents, living her unique self, and growing into God, who God created her to be. And that same prayer is for you. Are you living someone else's dream instead of the one that God has placed in you? Are you living your authentic life? Are you living according to someone else's fears, someone else's expectations? Have you been told that you have to prove your worth in order to take up space on this planet? Are you chasing after more and more, only to find yourself with less and less, emotionally and spiritually. And if you are, don't believe the lies of the adversary who devours dreams and destroys life. Don't believe the lies that tell you that you matter because of what you achieve. Don't believe the lies that tell you that your gifts and skills and talents should be put aside in order to conform to what society and culture calls the good life. Don't believe the lies that tell you that your uniqueness needs to fit into what others say is right and good and godly. Because God tells you a different story. God tells you that you are celebrated for who you are, for what you bring in this world. And you are encouraged to chase after that dream that God has placed in you. And not chase after someone else's dream. Because you honor God by living your most authentic self by which I mean living the person that God has created you to be. And when you live that life, a life that deepens your humanity, you grow more fully into the image of God who created you. So from now on, let not your eyes be blinded by the lights, and may you find your way back home. And may this be so among us. Amen.